So our next guest is an accomplished industrial designer, everything from toys to pig tracking devices. Um, and over the last decade, uh, she's helped Nike um, become uh, one of the really the leading lights in uh, corporate sustainability practices. So please welcome Lori Vogel. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, within Nike, what was your path to becoming sort of the uh, uh, chief of Nike considered, um, uh, uh, to really turning to sustainability being a subject as opposed to a product? So for those of you who may or may not know what Considered is, Considered is the group at Nike that is all about creating sustainable products. And so um, I had been the innovation director for Nike before I took this job to head up sustainable design. And um, I remember when they offered me the position, um, I don't know, it just kind of made sense to me from the standpoint, from a design perspective, which is um, I think all designers, want to design products that are better for the planet. I just think a lot of times they just don't know how to do it. And for me, I, I think it's really more about education and understanding. And so, um, I, you know, for me, there's been a lot of times um, in my life that I think back on that I've just been very, very aware of how products are made. Now, there's some basic driving forces in terms of how you're looking at the problem of, of both a sustainable corporate culture, but moreover, making a sustainable manufacturing process. I'm wondering if you could kind of take us through that a little bit. Yeah, so I'll just say that one of the things that we focus on at Nike is we focus on our, our largest impacts, which is waste, water, toxics, and energy. So we always make sure that as we're making choices, because sometimes people just focus in one area and they don't focus on other areas. And so I see the water slide here, which we know water is the biggest issue to soon start facing the planet. And I think the one thing for us is it's really important to start to look ahead and start to design things and understand that it, it's really important to design things in a specific way and understand how they're manufactured, understand how much water is used. So for example, um, what we do is we make teams very aware of the impact. So like a t-shirt, I don't think anybody realizes that when you wear a t-shirt, it's 700 gallons to make one t-shirt. Right? It's in the growing process of the cotton, it's in the dyeing and finishing. So one of the things our team does is we make people very aware of the impacts of the products, and then we also give alternative suggestions to the designers on how they can reduce their impact. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the, um, I'm going to skip ahead because we're sort of running out of time. One of the major successes has been a simple soccer jersey. I love, through the, I love this soccer jersey. I, I mean, it takes eight plastic bottles to make one jersey. And the, the reason why I love this is because this is for the World Cup, the team kits. And so you had the best performing products out there for our soccer players. But at the same time, the great thing about it with recycled polyester is that you're taking plastic bottles out of landfill. At the same time, you don't introduce new CO2 into the environment. You don't introduce new toxics and obviously you reduce a significant amount of waste. So for me, it was a huge success because it made it very clear that, you know, we can actually reverse engineer how we do things and we can start to use different material streams. Of the initiatives that you've worked on so far, what, what are you proudest of? What do you think has really moved the ball down the field, so to speak? Actually, one of the things that I'm, I'm most proud of is that we've created a considered index for our entire design community at Nike which is at the moment a designer starts to sketch a shoe or a shirt, we start to give them instant feedback on how they're doing. So for example, when they choose materials, we score each one of the materials that they choose from zero to 100. We also at the same time tell them how they're doing around reducing waste and how they're doing around using, you know, waterless, water-based adhesives. So the whole time that we're doing this process, we're really making sure that the designers understand the impact of their choices and, and I guess what I'm really proud of is this same index, we opened it up to the entire apparel industry and now they're beginning to adopt this index and our material assessment tools. So we feel like it won't just have an impact within Nike, but it'll also have an impact within the entire um, apparel and footwear industry. You've also created open source uh, uh, um, um, uh, recipes, correct, for, right. um, uh, for toxic free um, rubbers? Yeah, so, so one of the things is that we introduced the Green Exchange, mm -hmm. which is um, a tool that was 
allowing people to really open up their patents. Because right now, if you want to open up a patent that's good for the environment, the only thing you really can do is you either open it up or you close it. And, and one of the things we've done with the Green Exchange is we've really been able to create an online sharing platform so that there are different ways that you can license out a patent. So what we did was we opened up all of Nike pat patents so that they could be used for nonprofits and they could also be used for um, universities and research institutions. So from that standpoint, um, it allows you to say, we can start to share patents because there's so many great patents that are allowing products to be more sustainable, but because you're locked out, you're not able to utilize the best technology. And so one of the things that we did was we opened up green rubber, which is we were able to reduce toxics 96% by weight um, when we came out with that new rubber formulation, and then we opened it up to the rest of the industry. So it's just the one thing about sustainability, it's really all about sharing and figuring out a better way um, to make sure that people are, are, once again, choosing the right materials. Now, you're unusual in terms of being a woman in the upper ranks of, of, of industrial design. Uh, these are a couple of the, you know, really great uh, um, uh, industrial designers in, in the world, Yves Behar and Jonathan Ive from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, Apple. And I'm curious about just the, the nature of how women operate in the business. Uh, um, do you, is, is there a difference? Is there a, a, a reason why you've been able to achieve what you've been able to achieve? Yeah, I don't know if there's a difference. I don't think there's that many of us, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the one thing is, is that I, I think back to when I was in industrial design school, is that this was back at Syracuse. And so there were the interior designers, and they were pretty much all female. And then there were the industrial designers, and they were all guys, except for two of us. And so I'm not really quite sure why that is. I, I think the one thing for me is if you have girls, you should encourage them to take things apart because I think that, I don't know, I, I think maybe guys are more encouraged to take things apart, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I think the thing for me is um, I just would like to see more opportunity for mm -hmm. women in this field. And so I don't know being a female if that allowed me to advance in this field. I, I will say that um, from the world of sustainability, I ha have actually seen more females in this space. And so that that's for me is sometimes I wonder if um, – I think women multitask better, and so I think sometimes that they're better systems thinkers, but I've been killed by saying this before <laughs> because I, they plastered my wall, the guys in my group, and, and said only linear thinkers outside here, so <laughs> it's not that I think guys are linear thinkers. I just think that sometimes when you're designing a product, you're so enamored with designing the car that you don't actually think about all the concrete that's going to create all the roads, that's going to create all the parking lots, that's going to create all the garages and all the impacts for it. And maybe that's just in general that people don't think about that. Mm -hmm. But I think that being a systems thinker is really important from a sustainability and a design perspective. Five to ten years, what will Nike look like? What do you think we'll be thinking about? What will be the you know, contemporary edge of sustainability? So, so my hope would be is our vision for where we'd like the future to be is we'd really like to get the closed loop. I think um, Doug mentioned it before when he talked about nature, that there is no waste in nature. And so I think the one thing that we'd like to see is that you can take materials from an old shoe and an old shirt and grind them up and turn them into a new shoe and a new shirt. And so the idea would be that we would design things that they would be easy to disassemble. We would take those resources back and bring them back into society. And so for me, the biggest thing I will say or the saddest thing about society right now is I think we're probably within nature the only, you know, mammal that actually creates waste. And so one of the things that I believe, you know, we're going to add a third more people to the population by 2050. And so resources are currently declining at a rate they're not being replenished. So from that perspective, I think we have to figure out we can't continue to make things that end up in a landfill. We have to design things that we want to recover those and we want to bring them back in so that resources are continuing to be in play. Mm -hmm. So my hope would be that in five years, you know, we would move to a different model where we would ultimately, these products would be coming back in. And how, how um, I mean, you know, the obvious question, I mean, Nike, one of the, you know, major consumer forces, uh, you know, of, of, you know, the past 30 years, I mean, in, in terms of its evolution, you know, is really about 
making stuff and creating desire for stuff. And so w how does Nike function as a tool within this larger agenda? Well, I think the one thing is, because people always say to, to me, how can you be a part of sustainability when part of the problem is that you create consumption? And, and I think part of the issue is when we talk about consumption is the problem is, is that when you create products today, you do consume resources. But if you could change that from consumption to transaction, which is ultimately you're utilizing that material, but then you're going to utilize it again. So I think the problem is, is that the way things have been designed is really more about consumption. But there are ways that you can design things so that you can bring back those, you know, all different pieces and parts of the design and repurpose it back into a new design. One of the things is we could tell people that we want people to consume less, and that might just happen. Um, naturally because the prices of resources might go up and then people will consume less but I also think people have the desire to continue to change so if I told you I made a shoe for you that's gonna last forever I will guarantee you that after five years you'd be tired of it so I don't want to fight the culture of people what I'd rather do is I'd rather design things that allow them when they are tired of it they can bring it back and it can be repurposed into something else well we began with art let's end with art no. <laughs> he picked the wrong. Uh, I did. I blew it. I, <laughs> I just want to let you know it was the thinker. I'm not about to talk about the kiss here. So this is from the Rodin Museum. And so he was asking me what's one of my places that I visit again and again. This is really funny. My husband must be getting a kick out of this. But <laughs> so um, the one thing for me is um, my brother was an au pair in Paris and I was like a sophomore in college and I got to go for a free ride, just kind of live in his little place. And um, he would go in the mornings and he would write and I would go there and I would sketch at the Rodin Museum. And if you've ever been there, it's one of the most beautiful museums. It's, it's just out in this beautiful garden. And so the thinker which is what that slide should be. So the thinker is a large sculpture that you can come upon. And I think it was when I was in the crossroads of trying to decide what I wanted to do in life. And so when I was there, I go back to that sculpture again and again every time I'm in Paris because it allows me the opportunity to rethink my life and just to try and imagine, you know, now I'm here and now I'm 46. And when I was there and I was 22, what I was thinking about. And so I, and maybe it's, appropriate that it's the thinker because you know it's just somebody's pondering and trying to figure out what they want in life and so I, I'm always at that point in my life where I'm always trying to figure out what I want to do next. And it's always in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. With that um, let's thank Lori and bring our other speakers back up. Doug and Craig. If we could move these chairs over.